Mic test, mic test for audio. Mic test, this is the audio check. Mic test, one, two, three.
you about the public comment if you'd like. Okay. I think that totally makes sense. I'm going to keep my report very short. Okay. 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 Thank you, Julian. All right. Uh, welcome. I'd like to call to order the Board of Education meeting of April 3rd, 2024. Please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. And I'll ask Mr. Rowe for a reiteration of the executive session motions. Uh, we entered executive session for three purposes. First, uh, to discuss the employment history of a particular, particular group of persons. Uh, second was uh, discussing the record of a particular student. And third was the potential acquisition, sale, exchange, or lease of real property. Okay, thank you. Um, and by way of opening remarks, I'll just welcome everybody. Um, there is, you know, as everyone's aware, bad weather tonight, so yeah. we're trying to have a brief meeting. Um, I think some people are here to talk about the uh, Julianne's Playground. Mm -hmm. We don't have any update on that or not taking any action. Right. Um, but we're, we are going to move up public comment, um, so if anybody would like to speak, I'll invite you to the microphone now. And just say your name and address. Good evening, uh, Arthur Center 123 Cliff Avenue. Um, parent of two students who graduated from Helm High School after going through K through 12, and was very happy when they entered middle school and learned that um, Latin was available and remember having a conversation with Mr. Ryan at the time and said I was so pleased that Pelham offered Latin and he said, yeah, Pelham has always had a commitment to Latin. Uh, even in the 1970s when many schools were getting rid of Latin, Pelham, Pelham kept it on. A um, Little bit of research and it turns out Mr. Ryan is 100% correct. Uh, Pelham Memorial High School has had Latin from the day it opened almost 100, over 100 years ago. Um, in 1924, when the school was kind of just coming into its own, there were three full-time Latin teachers uh, in the school. Wow. Uh, in 1940, there were actually five teachers teaching Latin, three full-time, and two that were also teaching some other language. Wow. Um, the school, interestingly, the student body in 1926, when they were graduating, adopted a motto, uh, Veni Vidi Vici. I mean, and they chose a Latin motto when they were, when they were uh, graduating. Um, Latin continued uh, into the 90s, <clears throat> and when the school district was thinking about um, swapping out Italian or putting back Italian back in, uh, the Board of Ed uh, said we would, they would put Italian back in, but they wanted a commitment uh, that Latin would be kept. And it was a smart decision because throughout the 90s in the Pelham Weekly, every year you can see that there are multiple students winning all kinds of Latin awards uh, for that entire period. Um, in the 2000s, uh, I thought my first rodeo here, there was some conversation of getting rid of Latin at that time. Unfortunately, it was kept on uh, until now. A um, little bit of interesting information is uh, Mr. Ryan sold us, sold us a little bit short because uh, the history of Latin in Pelham goes back even further. So the first Pelham High School that was at Siwanoi School uh, not only had Latin, uh, but it was required. Four years of Latin was required in order to meet the college preparatory uh, curriculum that was offered at that time. And then going back even further, uh, the very first schoolhouse that Pelham had on Split Rock Road that was probably there by about 1850, uh, one room schoolhouse, all the kids from Pelham in one room. It was said that there was a pot belly stove in the middle of the room and the kids who sat close to the stove roasted and the kids who <laughs> sat at the edges froze to death. <laughs> Notwithstanding the rudimentary facility that they were in, uh, Latin was taught. So right after recess when they came back from lunch, uh, they learned uh, uh, Latin quotations and translated them into English. Uh, so that was from about 1850 forward. So it really is the entire history of the public education system in Pelham that we've had Latin. Having said all that, um, I am not necessarily a fan of preserving a tradition that doesn't have any meaning. So I would make the same case and hopefully make a compelling case to you of why 
it should be kept in the Pelham School District now. Um, basically, every discipline has some kind of Latin in it. So we start with the fact that the English language has a Latin script alphabet, right? That's the alphabet we use is the same as, as the Romans. Um, add to that that approximately 30% of our vocabulary stems from a Latin word. And really interestingly, when we're so focused on STEM, in science and technology, 90% of the words that are used in science and technology are derived from Latin. Um, add on to that all of the professions that are out there. Um, Mr. President, you know that in medicine, muscles, bones, most of them come from Latin words. Uh, Sid, you know in the law, we have all kinds of legal uh, concepts that are in Latin. In botany, every plant that exists in the world it has a Latin name, so every oak is named a Quercus with some kind of mm -hmm. a adjective after that. Every maple is an acer. I mean, these are words that in these professions are, are fully understood and are important. It's often said that Latin is a dead language, and it's not really an appropriate term. What Latin is, is it, it's a static language. And that's the reason why it's used, is that unlike English and other modern languages which change over time, Latin is eternal. It will never change. So the gluteus maximus is always going to be the gluteus maximus, no matter, no matter what we call our butts. Like, that's always going to be the muscle. So it's, it's preserved forever. It's the same reason why all of the schools that our kids go to for college usually have Latin mottos. In fact, Pelham School District, I don't know if anybody has a, a seal in front of you, but the school district has a seal that has a Latin motto on it. So even our, even our school district has a Latin, Latin motto. Um, it's the well, reason we use Roman numerals, because they're deemed to be eternal. So no, no matter how a seven might change in other languages, a seven in Roman numerals is always going to be a seven. So it's static in the sense that it preserves forever and it becomes universal. So no matter what spoken language you have, whether you are in Africa or Europe or South America, it's the same term that transcends all other languages when you want to talk about a concept in Latin. Um, so those would be the reasons to keep it. Obviously, there are practical reasons uh, when kids are learning vocabulary and they're trying to figure out um, words for the SAT or any kind of a test. If you have some basic Latin, you can usually figure out any of the words that come from Latin from those words. I think it just adds richly to the curriculum. Um, if I can take just another minute, I just want to talk a little bit about the mechanics. If, if you do decide to keep this, which I hope you will. Uh, when I was last here in probably 2008 or 9 or somewhere thereabouts and talking about why to keep Latin, there were, uh, let's just say, misunderstandings at the time uh, that were driving Latin out. Uh, one of the misunderstandings was that kids didn't want to take it. And on further examination, it turned out that it was being offered at a period where the kids could not take it. It was conflicting with other required classes, so it was not possible. Uh, for them to really fit it in the schedule. The other misunderstanding was uh, we had an excellent middle school Latin teacher mm -hmm. who was in the process of getting certified and uh, the district uh, let him go because they thought he wasn't getting certified and in talking to that Latin teacher at the time who went to Regis to teach instead of in Pelham uh, said that no, he was getting certified but the district would not offer him a full-time position. And I think that's also critical. Um, as I said, uh, in the 1920s, there were two or three full-time positions for Latin. And I think to get somebody to teach it and teach it well, there needs to be a commitment to a teacher that we are going to fund this, we are going to have this, and we're going to make it a full-time position. So those were the misunderstandings that led to this the last time, which fortunately, after talking to the Board of Ed, they were rectified and they were able to find a teacher. One other misunderstanding was the jobs were being posted on some site where classical majors don't really go. So there are specific websites if you're looking for a Latin teacher or want to post for a Latin teacher where somebody who's trained in that um, discipline would, would go to look for a job. So um, I think any obstacles are surmountable. And um, you know, as we used to tell our kids, there are lots of words in the English language and two that do not go together are I can't. <laughs> so, um, you know, we can't is not something that we should have in a vocabulary at Pelham. Um, and I hope that you'll take this into consideration and continue to fund Latin and keep the tradition of Pelham having Latin going. Thank you. Is, is there a particular grade span that you think would be best for Latin? 
So I think it's, I think it's very important um, to talk about my kids a little bit. Um, each of them um, took Latin starting in middle school. So they had the foundation of Latin, and then when they got to high school, they each added another romantic language. So my daughter um, took four years of Spanish in addition to continuing with Latin, and my son took Italian. So by having the foundation of Latin, they could add on to another, another romantic language. So by the time they graduated, they had, each had five years of Latin and four years of Spanish and either two or three years of Italian. Um, so I think that that's important. I was, frankly, rather shocked to find that um, it was taught in the one-room schoolhouse in Prospect Hill. Um, I, you know, not a bad idea to kind of introduce it a little bit maybe in the elementary school, not, not, not a big part of the curriculum, but to have them learn a few phrases that might be meaningful for, for later in life. Um, but I think the middle school foundation is, makes a lot more sense than starting with some romantic language and trying to add Latin onto it. It's been my experience anyway. Um, uh, you've obviously, you know, you know your material on this and you've done it. Look, do you get a, a feeling for what the hiring pool is like for Latin teachers? I have not looked into that, um, but I do think that they are easier to come by if, if the school district will accommodate them and let them have some time to get certified while promising them a full-time position. Right. Um, I think that that's what the mistake was the last time. I mean, this teacher that we let go, who I'm, I'm trying to figure out his name. In fact, I texted my son to see if he could remember it, but he's in Morocco or something very right now, um, and he didn't get back to me. But I, I, he was the most excellent teacher, and everybody was really sorry to see him go. And he said at the time that usually you just, you just need to give, because they're often coming from private schools where they don't need the certification, that you just need to give them a little bit of time to get certified. And I think that's within district policy. Usually the district allows uh, some time for teachers to get certified if they're not when they get here. And would you make it required in middle school? I don't think I would make it required. Right. Um, okay. It's, um, I, 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 I think it's, you know, it should be, it should be an elective. I mean, all, all the languages should really be an elective, especially in middle school. Um, but that's your call. I, I'd just like to see it offered. Anything yeah. else? Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Speak in Latin. Hello. <laughs> you have to speak in Latin. I haven't done this. I know Latin. <laughs> I don't know anything about Latin. <laughs> Learned a lottery by him. Uh -huh. John Hines, 316, Third Avenue, Pelham. Uh, thank you. I know you already said that you weren't going to table or discuss this, uh, the water pump situation tonight. The reason that a few of us got together is uh, a bunch of people did call or text me, got in touch with me and asked certain things. I am not the spokesperson for it, but for some reason they reached out to me. A few people were coming. I said, I'll come also. One of the reasons we come is because in your... Uh, one of the things in your executive session, you guys were talking about property. I, I know it's not our business, but that raised a little caution or red flag, so that's one of the reasons I came here. If you don't mind, I know you're not discussing it tonight. I just want to know, if you can, what step is it at? Um, I know the last time when I came to this meeting and following up and listening to the people and reading the articles and stuff that the mayor wanted to go try to take the property and what have you. Not to get to the whole legal thing, but just board of ed answer. Is there any process that you guys are up to right now? What stage we're up to? We, so what, what's, what's happened is we had authorized some representatives to sort of discuss or negotiate with the village of Pelham. So that is Will, Jackie, Zed, and they've had at least one meeting. Mm -hmm. yes. And one meeting. yeah, and maybe one email. Yeah. <laughs> um, but nothing. So when there's we no, no agreements, no no plans for future future meetings. So at committees this point. together discussing with the village on a possible project. Yes, we're <laughs> author we're authorized to um, discuss the the transfer, transfer. of, Ju of right. Julianne's. So so that is all right. So that's what I'm trying for, to get at. So consideration. That's consideration, right? And it's, yeah. it's not a final stage yet, but but there is a process that it, this could happen. There, there, are, there, are, there, are, there are many outcomes. Okay. There are, there are many outcomes um, that where this could end in many outcomes, and we don't have, we haven't agreed upon any of them. Yeah. Okay. All right. You guys will just keep us. We'll keep you. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. Keep you informed. All right. 
I'll see you. <laughs> <laughs> All right, that's it. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thank you. Anybody else? And, you know, I, I guess the, the only other comment about that is, you know, it's not our project. Um, we didn't initiate this. We're not seeking it out. Um, so if you do have more questions about it, I would encourage you to go to the Village of Pelham directly. Um, and my understanding is the funding is coming from Westchester County, so to probably also ask you know, your representatives in Westchester County about their involvement. Okay. I think that brings us to our line-by-line -line budget review. Yes. I'm going to let Jim kick it off tonight. Okay. <coughs> Let me get the big book out. Well, I would say, well, I get my binder out, too. Yeah. Okay, good evening. Uh, so this evening we, is the, uh, the remainder of the budget review uh, up for this evening. Uh, as we had on the schedule before, uh, it's operations and maintenance, community services, uh, Board of Education, Administration, Business Administration, Transportation, Debt Service. So it's a, it's a bunch of smaller um, cost centers. Uh, so first up is our operations and maintenance. Uh, John Condon, our facilities director, is here and uh, he's ready to go. So uh, John, come on down. And with Jackie Vihill, our treasurer. Uh, if you will, uh, we're going to start on B5, so if you look under the general support tab of your book, that's where B5 begins. And we're gonna hit some of those other pages, those earlier pages uh, after John comes and speaks. So uh, B5 and then as our our worksheet says there's some more detail that falls under appendices uh, three. So with that, John, you got it. <clears throat> Good evening. Can you hear me? Good evening. Thanks for this opportunity. I uh, appreciate your service as well. Um, tonight we're going to talk about um, our budget for uh, facilities for the upcoming year. First, I want to start off with the uh, um, the budget to budget increase that's being requested is 1.4% year to year. That's for, you know, includes everything for cost escalations, absorbing whatever we can, and keeping things um, where it's supposed to be. So we're going to start off, as uh, Mr. Ricky said, on B5, number one, custodial maintenance salaries. Um, you can see it's 0 0.04, and the reason for that is that's in the middle of uh, contract negotiations. Um, We're going to uh, summer help salaries. These are, uh, this is a summer program that we do where we hire um, young people from the town to help us with the, uh, the building. And quite honestly, it's not help, it's actually our workforce. Uh, we do have limited workforce in our staff. We are um, not heavily uh, staffed. And without this, uh, this summer help, we wouldn't get the buildings ready for the coming year. Uh, if you look at substitute uh, coverage and salaries, there's a little bit of uh, backwards numbers there. If you, my, my question, if you, if you would, and part of that reason there is um, a lot of the subject cover, we have uh, absentees, we're not, I think they're not absentees, but we did have openings in our, um, in our ranks, which were backfilled with overtime, and if you do the math on that, there was a $40,000 savings, so it, it worked out to our advantage. Um, School-related slash emergency, not school-related emergency, but if you could, uh, if you want to follow along, uh, if you go to G1, where G, G1 we're at, or G2, still at G1. So school, school related uh, and emergency, emergencies being snow, which is considered emergency, floods, uh, any other problems that we'd have to come in for, you know, uh, or and um, school related would be um, any events that go on uh, after school. Um, Perhaps board meetings that run late, um, you name it, uh, whatever it is, that, that, that's, that's where that money's come, for, come from. Graduation, we get, we get prom, plays. junior prom, 
theater, right? Siwanoi Day, you name it, we got, you know, you, all those fun events, our guys are in the background there taking care of it and making sure everybody has a nice time. And if any, you know, anybody wants to stop at any point or want some more elaboration, I'll be happy to stop. Um, all right, so we're on Q2, right? Okay. Going to uh, equipment for ground supplies. Uh, ask for no change. Um, we really haven't replaced that much this year, that, but that money's there for replacement of weed whackers, lawn mowers, uh, smaller equipment. Um, you know, we, we do have a, a good staff that take care of their equipment. We try to uh, make the equipment last. Uh, we replaced an engine in a, a walk-behind mower this year as opposed to replacing it, so it was a lot cheaper and it made a lot of sense. The equipment was in good shape, except for the motor, so that, that was a cost saving. So we didn't see a big expenditure here. Building equipment, same thing. It's buffers, strippers, vacuums, that sort of thing to replace uh, uh, cleaning equipment. Um, we try to automate as much as possible since my time here. We've added automated uh, cleaning machines, walk behind uh, floor machines, keep the building cleaner, faster, more efficient, and try to you know, utilize that workforce somewhere else. Um, mechanical equipment is for HVAC equipment, replacing fan units, compressors, air conditioners. We just recently replaced a condensate uh, return pump in the high school, which I believe was 50 or so, like <laughs> about $50,000 for that. Um, you can come see it, it's lovely, it's nice and, and like nicely installed. Uh, so that was up and running over Easter. We got that done when everybody was out of here so we wouldn't have any downtime for heat. Uh, we go into the fun, like uh, fuel and lighting now which will take us to G3. Uh, um, so we go into uh, fuel. Uh, there is reserve. Okay, we go into fuel lighting. Fuel. Right. Right, so if, if the board's look to net it out, there's a, on the back page of your budget book, again, you've got all the detail to the contingency, so you'd be able to uh, determine exactly what that line item is and where we have those items we we have in the comments section that it is an area of contingency and obviously it's the same uh, numbers from last year but we have it obviously fuel has gone up in in price we burn primarily uh, gas here we do not burn oil when we can avoid it we in the high school here we are on a uh, demand con it forces us we have to go to oil but we try to avoid the oil because the gas is more efficient and cheaper. Um, electric, we, although we didn't increase that, we're expecting or anticipating a 32% increase. That's what everybody's um, budgeting around for it. That's what they told us the increases would be. Um, we're at the uh, mercy of the uh, energy companies and you know, ever since, I guess, Indian Point went off, all the other reasons, prices have just skyrocketed. Has, has anybody seen their Con Ed bill at home? Well, I, I, if I can jump in too, yes, fortunately sir. enough, we, as a municipal entity, we are uh, entitled to purchase our power at the New York Power Authority. So we're able to at least obtain a favorable rates. Uh, and then we pay a delivery charge through the local, uh, local utility, which is Con Ed. Um, water service, we uh, scheduled an increase for that based on their anticipations as well. The... Um, as we know, water, uh, water service used to be from Suez. Now it's Biola. They were recently sold. They seem to be doing a lot of work just around town. You see everything getting marked out. They're going to um, be replacing valves all around, if you haven't noticed, um, which, you know, you don't mind as much when um, they're actually doing work for the additional monies. Telephone and Internet, uh, or Ethernet service, uh, you'll notice an increase there because I absorbed the budget for uh, Internet for up at uh, – Sanborn as well down at Glover. We added high-speed internet to both of those. Obviously, uh, we needed that up at Sanborn for the new offices up there. But down at Glover was uh, for the security camera systems and uh, the local live that was added in, which you know people can watch games and watch their kids. If they're not able to be at the game, they can watch the game. So we needed that service down there. Um, All right, professional consultants. Um, learn about what's covered in this. I'll just let you know. Architectural building condition survey was a big number this year. We're doing our building condition survey. 
just for everybody's edification, we do a building condition survey every five years. However, this is eight years out for us. We haven't had a building condition in eight years due to the state reshuffling everything um, a few years back because everybody was doing them at the same time and it was impossible to get uh, professional services out to do an adequate job. So we're in the middle of doing our build building condition survey, which will be a valuable tool for the board going forward to make decisions on the buildings um, and see where we stand. Um, engineering consultant, if need be, landscape architect, if need be, an arborist to check our trees. We, are, um, we do have a masonry consultant that checks the buildings and, and uh, points out issues. Same thing with the roofing consultant, works with our, roofing, with our roofers, work on um, guaranteed roof guaranteed roof to get it repaired to make sure we're um, controlled under uh, warranty. Asbestos consultant as needed. Um, when we're doing smaller projects, if we're doing bigger projects, we'd uh, obviously we would need a much bigger bigger number than that. Okay. Um, all right, contract services. Uh, some of the stuff, and if you you know if you need any uh, you know boiler chemicals. Our boilers are treated. We have a company that comes in and uh, puts chemicals into the boilers. It's balanced. Every month they come back, they check the, the chemicals in the company, and they, they advance them or uh, retard the amount of chemicals that go into the, the water supply so that the boilers' um, uh, water stays neutral and it doesn't damage the boilers to as much as possible to try to extend our uh, aging boilers. Boiler cleaning is something that's done every year. You have to clean the boilers not only for efficiency but for safety. Um, you have boiler, you'll have buildup to prevent fire in your boiler. Seasonal startup is a normal startup for your boilers. They'll tune them, try to get the most efficiency out of the boilers that you can. Um, we go into fire alarm maintenance contract. We do a maintenance contract with a fire alarm system. So uh, we have fire alarms obviously in all our buildings, uh, smoke heads, uh, pull stations, um, you name it. Uh, every year, we 10% of the smoke heads in each of the buildings is cleaned as, as required. The system is tested uh, to make sure it responds to our um, off-site uh, service, and they, in turn, uh, contact um, fire and or the county dispatch. Um, um, fire extinguisher inspection, which happens every year. Every, every fire extinguisher has to be inspected every year. Fire suppression system, uh, maintenance inspections is more for the kitchens where they have ansol systems um, in case of a you know, grease fire uh, um, in our kitchen areas. Okay, now we're going into HVAC maintenance contract is with a company named Dakin. Um, they, are, uh, they do our uh, filter changes on all our rooftop units and, and all our HVAC units around the district um, uh, throughout the year. That contract right now is out to bid. Um, and I believe they're coming in on Monday for uh, those bid openings. Uh, speaking of bids, we have advertising for bids and employment. Um, the nice part, we, have, we don't really put the employment out to bid anymore because, quite frankly, we haven't gotten a lot of feedback from um, the, uh, the journal. Okay. We don't get the journal. But, so we put it up on OLAS. I'm not, I'm not aware if there's a cost for that or not, to be honest with you. Perhaps Dr. Garcia could elaborate on that but um, we advertise for bids we put out the bids we also reach out to folks um, you know that we know in the business that to try to get a lot of interest in um, in contracts that we put out right now we have HVAC uh, out we have uh, tree and we have masonry out right now for bid that are all being opened on Monday so the more you get a little competition never never hurts everybody backflow uh, device inspection um, backflow devices are on all your water supplies for all our irrigation systems, which we have many, plus all our water um, uh, meters in the buildings, and that's to protect the water source so that no contamination can come into the closed water source for all of us in our homes and everything else. Um, it's required by law. We not only have to have those, but we also uh, do an inspection on those um, every year to make sure they're operating correctly. Um, dust mop and um, mat cleaning, so all the mats when you come into the building, we do uh, subscribe to a service for that where they take the mats, they give us new mats. The dust mops, which are used to clean the floors, um, are changed out and they're brought back. Um, um, 
Elevator inspection, pretty obvious. That's gone up. If you, if, uh, we have the elevator inspection, not a big cost, but down further, we'll go into elevators. We've added a lot of elevators, and you're going to say, when did they come on? But we had elevators that were under warranty, so we added two elevators to Hutchison, one to um, uh, Prospect, and um, those are all um, added to that maintenance cost. We do have the elevator chair contract, which also is required to be inspected. We have basically one of those in the high school, one in the auditorium in the high school, and then we have two lifts in the, um, the locker rooms, both boys and girls, so they all have to be inspected. Energy audit and report, uh, reporting is a, is a legacy project for an energy uh, performance project that was out, um, I guess, predating all of us here, um, but we're required to um, have the energy audit with that to prove that we're actually still saving money on that work that was done 15, 16 years ago. Well, last one. We're coming right near the end of that performance period. Right. Equipment rental, that would cover lifts, like if we have to come into the gym and order a lift, or if we, we don't, we tend not to buy heavier duty equipment, like heavy saws for cutting concrete or something like that, so we'll just rent them. We have good rental companies, a nice part about being in this area, good access to um, good resources, but I have an own it for a piece of equipment that you'll use, you know, once or twice, it'll just sit there. It's a, a lot easier just to rent it and then give it back. Exterminator service contract, pretty self-explanatory, I think. Um, fire inspections, an annual fire inspection that we do. We have to have a certified person with uh, SED um, credentials that comes in and does a fire inspection. Um, it's an annual, it grow every year we lose a month, so it's really every 11 months that we do it. And um, we report them that, that up to SED, and it's required for us to pass our fire inspection um, and make sure everything is corrected before we'll get uh, a certificate of occupancy for the building. So that's a very important thing, and that takes the cooperation of everybody because it's everybody's issue. Um, generator maintenance service agreement. We do have one generator in the district, which is located over at Colonial. It's there in case we lose power because we do have what we call a knife switch on the sewer over there, uh, predating me, and I'd like to give. Uh, props to my predecessor for putting in that equipment because uh, with that in there a nice switch on the sewer line when the water backs up over there it stops the um, water from coming in the building in through the uh, the sewer and that nice switch is electrically operated so if we lose power and we don't have power the generator kicks in to um, um, do that hopefully that hasn't happened since I've been here thankfully so that's good landscape maintenance contract we do have a landscape uh, maintenance contract and again I that's another bid that's actually out going out on Monday. Um, they cut our grass, they take care of our leaves, they take care of our gutters. Um, again, I'll give props to my predecessor for drawing up a very elaborate contract on that that makes them clean the gutters, which is fantastic. Um, it's a necessary part. Um, moving expenses, um, again, pretty self-explanatory. If you need boxes, if we're moving offices or having to move uh, other things around. Um, I was told not to make a joke. POTS lines, uh, PA system, notification lights, uh, digital announcers. POTS lines, for those of you who don't know, is a plain old telephone line, okay? So that's what it actually stands for. So we still have uh, a lot of uh, copper line here. A lot of all our elevators have backup uh, phones in them. That's all uh, phone lines. Um, we have phone lines for our uh, you know, every felt, every telephone, every li every every lift has a phone. It's all required by law. We have um, communication devices on our staircases where we have uh, areas of refuge for a fire. So all these lines are replicated. A lot of them are still POTS lines. A lot of our um, technology department took over all the phone lines away from me with the digital lines because uh, the phone companies have gone all digital, but. Some of these are legacy ones that they can't be switched over to um, digital at this time. I imagine they will, but it, they were doing um, these individual lines are, I think are more time time consuming for the phone company to do so. Refuse collection, obviously self-explanatory. Security alarm monitoring, another bid that we have out that's opening on Monday. Currently we use Scarsdale Security, so we do have silent alarms in all the buildings. So if somebody were to break into the building, we know immediately that alarm goes to our, our security company and then to the police department or dispatch to capture the person and prosecute, of, of course, for trespass. Um, sprinkler, standpipe system, service, maintenance. We do have sprinklers in, in a good section of our building. 
So sometimes heads have to be replaced. Uh, we do have standpipes in other areas. Standpipes are for where the fire department would hook in water so they wouldn't have to drag hoses as far. They could hook in one side of the building and charge the system and then just drag one hose upstairs and God forbid have to fight a fire on the third floor. Um, but like I said, most of our buildings do have sprinkler and um, that would knock down a, a good part of it. Um, Vita Root um, service contract is for uh, our oil tanks. It monitors our oil tanks above and below ground. We have some that are vaulted above ground. We have some that are underground, like at Siwanoi. Uh, the middle school and uh, Prospect are all underground, so we do have a system that monitors, make sure they're, they're intact, make sure water doesn't get in, and make sure they don't leak. We're required to do daily checks on these boilers uh, and record that for Westchester County. Um, Westchester County monitors um, um, well, well, all the oil tanks in the county, they will come around, they will find if they find discrepancies. So these systems are great. It'll get an alarm if there's some sort of problem. It could be a cap could be loose and it will report that to us and we make sure that, um, you know, they're operating correctly. I know several years back there was an issue at I with a leaking tank that had to get replaced. Um, but since then there was a, there's been a new system put in. Um, okay. Four four two would be repair lines, right? All right. So, um, I'm All right. Four four two is repair. Um, if you look at G six, so uh, abatement projects, uh, asbestos abatement, air testing. So when you do um, when you do any asbestos uh, project, you're required to hire an independent tester. Can't be somebody you know, it can't be related to whomever does the actual asbestos abatement so that it's, um, and that also reports to the health department. So if we have a small project, if we were chopping a wall open and we wanted to fix a drain and we found pipe wrap that was su suspect for asbestos, we'd have it tested. There's a cost for that. If we need to get it removed, we'd have to have a company come in and monitor that removal. Um, so that, would, that, that that's what that money is there for. Um, if we're doing larger scale projects, which we, we'd have to have a, a, a much bigger project for that. Um, let's see. This was our tank right below the ground. Yeah, maybe it's what's in the What's in the Yeah. Okay. All right. Mm -hmm. So boiler repair and upgrades again. Um, we do have aging boilers. All our boilers are approximately 30 years of age. Um, so we do, you know, do some repairs on those. We just replaced two condensate tanks at the high school last year and this year, which were big ticket items. Clock repair and services um, are for our uh, locked-in clocks, as well as um, a lot of our, some of our clocks in our systems are tied into um, uh, uh, the intercom system where they're all keeping time. Some of our clocks are basically atomic clocks where they're all independent of each other, but that's a cost for that. And we've also used that to work on the clock on the um, the, uh, the school tower. For those of you who don't recall, we did do some work on that last year where we uh, fixed the clock. The clock wasn't working. It's actually a four-phase clock for many people don't know that because you can't see the fourth side on it. But to me, it was important to get the fourth phase fixed. So we got that fixed. There's a new, um, it's new digital um, um, drive behind it that keeps the clock on time. It's on time. I check it periodically. Um, and we also put in LED lighting up there so we don't have to change any bulbs and it looks great at night and very cool. I know Todd Cross, I don't know, some of you know him from town, sent me a very cool picture on the full moon with the clock. I could share it with you if you really want to, but uh, <laughs> so he, he liked that night. I did as well. Um, contingency for unforeseen projects and requests could be anything. Somebody needs, uh, you know, maybe there's a, a um, special education need or something, maybe a ramp that needs to be built for a child or a room needs to be divided or unforeseen. If I knew what it was, I'd be able to tell you, but those are the kinds of things <laughs> that are out there. Um, electrical pair, pretty obvious. We do electrical pairs, everything from changing light bulbs at Glover, you know, bigger lift stuff to running new electric, maybe uh, you know, somebody needs a new outlet somewhere. Smaller stuff it will handle in-house, but bigger stuff will bring in um, the electrician we have on contract. HVAC repairs, same thing. We'll use various companies to do HVAC repairs, whether it's changing compressors or bigger items. 
we do have a, a, a good mechanic that works for us and he handles most of the smaller lift items, but the bigger things, it's just not cost effective to do so. Plumbing repairs, same thing, majority of it we do in-house. Um, roof repairs, pretty obvious. Um, we do have aging roofs here, which will definitely become, they only, they only leak in the rainy days, but that's the, uh, but the um, you know, for roof repairs, we call in the roofer, have them fixed, and, and move on from there. Um, and that he works in conjunction with our roof inspection to, you know, try to find uh, areas that are problematic before they happen. So he'll mark stuff out. We'll have the roofer come in, repair those areas that are, are, are marked out. Uh, sewer drain line cleaning service. So, you know, people in schools use, uh, obviously, bathrooms. We have hundreds of people, thousands of people that use these bathrooms and plumbing every day. You know, and things get washed down the drain that shouldn't be down there. We have a service that comes in and uh, cleans the drains. We've also used that same service for lining some drains. We have there's a process where you can line the inside of a drain, um, and we've had used that service to great effect. Sprinkler and standpipe system repair. That's back to repair that we talked about earlier. Acid waste management. Um, our chemical uh, our our labs produce. Uh, for lab experiments and whatnot, they use special sinks where they dump um, chemicals down with acid waste um, that goes into a lime box. Those lime boxes get changed out in the summer, and um, new lime is added. We also have uh, our new boilers up at Hutchison. Um, the high efficiency boilers actually the exhaust goes through um, lime as well because it's so so uh, caustic, um, so that water then is not dumped out into the sewer system and damaging our pipes. So that's what that's about. Backflow preventive repair and replacement. Uh, we talked about backflows uh, before, so they get tested and checked. Uh, BMS systems. Um, we do have a, a varied amount of BMS systems in the district. We go from everything from 1927 technology, which is pneumatic. We have uh, technology from probably 80s, 90s, and uh, our newest uh, technology is in our high, in um, Hutchinson, which is completely computer controlled. We can close off parts of the building, turn it on, turn it off, vacation modes, um, that sort of thing. So big energy savings um, that way. We've added newer controls or, uh, to our all our boilers in the district, so we have more control of our boilers, and we've definitely seen uh, fuel reductions because of that um, control. Um, but the more digital control you have, the more comfort there is for people in the building, and additionally, uh, the more savings you'll have, but it's an investment, of course. Uh, drops for uh, installation and moves, so if, uh, you know, if somebody has their desk over there and we're adding a new uh, occupant in a room and they need a drop for uh, a telephone and our um, computer, we have to run a wire for that, which goes back to the main server that comes to the room, so that so that money's for. Um, we will do some of that work in-house as well to try to save uh, some money there as well. Elevator repairs, it's in there again. We added um, elevators um, on. Um, equipment repairs is for our equipment, you know, uh, vacuums, buffing machines, floor machines, anything that we use in the building. Exterminator, additional services outside the contract. Um, Hey, I saw a raccoon at Colonial. There you go. There's, that's for that. Um, you really didn't see a raccoon at Colonial, <laughs> no, <laughs> for example. <laughs> not Colonial. Not our Colonial. No. Um, our, you know, we did have a, we did bring in a, a trapper for um, some rodents at a, um, down at Glover Field. We uh, removed uh, Poxitani, a few of them down there. So that was done down there. So that's where that money comes out of. Uh, where are we? Stop me if anybody wants them. Good. All right. Fire alarm uh, devices and equipment repairs. This is again smoke heads. Occasionally, you know, the, one of the problems with one of the good things about having a really good uh, alarm system and smoke heads, it go they go off um, if you get dust in them. If kids like to spray Axe spray in the locker rooms, that never happens. But um, <laughs> stuff like that will set off the alarm. And it's unfortunate when it, you know, high school and middle school is considered on, is one building, so one something goes off, the whole building goes off. But it lets you know how sensitive this equipment is. Um, so replacing a bad head, as it were, 
they identify themselves. Fire department has to come in. They will identify the spot. We'll figure out what what caused the problem. Was it you know something popcorn in the microwave or was it you know an actual uh, incident? Usually it's uh, popcorn, but that's okay. Um, fire extinguisher repair. Um, they generally just take them out and give us a new one. Uh, floor maintenance, refinishing, that's for, uh, we do all the high school floors ourselves, all the classrooms, Siwanoi, Colonial, are all wood floors, which is very unique, by the way, and very cool that we have wood floors. So we do that all in-house and take care of that. But our gyms, we do farm out, um, so that, that's money's there for that. Generator service and repair at Colonial. Back to the POTS line again, it keeps popping up there. Um, that's for all your uh, announcements, <coughs> your lights outside. We have the blue lights to let people know. Then we would do lockdown to keep away from the building. Public announcement system in the middle school. It's sort of a separate system. It's obviously the middle school's 20, 20 plus. So um, a little different than the upgraded system we have at uh, Hutchison, but um, it takes a little special care over there. Um, not every company can handle it. It's a little bit of a, um, a different thing. Radios, walkie-talkies, and microphones, so all our security personnel, all the administrators, um, all the custodians, all the grounds people, all the mechanics are all tied in by radios. We also support uh, a radio for each of the fire departments and for um, the police departments as well. So um, that's for replacing them, replacing batteries, um, making sure that's working, um, making uh, we also have um, repeaters at the high school and at Hutchison and at Prospect, so the money's there for that. Um, refuse container rent, rent, rental dumpsters during the summer when we're getting rid of, you know, bigger items, that's there for that. If we have to do a clean out, if we're doing a demo, replace, pulling out a wall like we did last summer, we, we opened up a classroom, so all that demo's got to go into a container, um, so that's what we'll do. We'll do work like that in-house. Security alarm repairs, if we're adding uh, a new keypad or if we're adding, uh, uh, you know, uh, a, a new stencil someplace, that's where that, that's money, money there for. Shade replacement, we do have a company comes in, uh, replacing, uh, repair shades. Side replace, sign replacements for all the school, you know, when classrooms get moved around, we try really hard not to name anything. Things should have a number. It shouldn't be, you know, Mr. Condon's office because when you get rid of me, you'll want to change the name. You want to just have it as a, a number, right? So that just saves a lot of time. And these signs are really pricey because they are uh, uh, Braille. They're required to be so, so they are pricey. Um, vacuum, wet vacuum repairs. You know, we can use a lot of vacuums. In the summertime, we have big wet vacs to help with the stripping of the floors and that sort of repair for our buffing machine strippers. Vehicle repairs, we do have an aging um, Vehicle fleet, I did order uh, two new vehicles, which I promise will be any day. I ordered them last August. I'm expecting them in August, so I hopefully I get the new year. Um, so I think we were replacing a 20-plus-year-old vehicle with that, which was a donation by a resident, was my understanding, um, originally, So it, which is kind of cool. Uh, window glass replacement. I was told it was bad luck to say this, but we haven't really used a lot of that this year. But... Um, that's what that is. Thank you. All right. Uh, playground inspection. Um, we have monies in there for that. Playground maintenance. Um, Money's in there. Tree pruning, uh, removal, and replacement. As I said, we have that out for bid now. Um, you know, we have the company go around. They do recommendations of what should be taken down. If something's unsafe or uh, you know needs to take down or prune, we do pruning. To try to keep everything, um, you know, from splitting. Um, we do, we do add trees. We add trees around the district wherever we can, where it makes sense to add trees. I mean, the problem is we are land uh, poor, really, and you know. Everybody wants to plant a, a, a lot of trees, but uh, they have to be planted correctly. They have to be planted in a place like, what are they going to look like in 20 years? The old joke is, you know, the best kind of planted tree was 20 years ago, but, you know, when people plant oaks right next to buildings, it creates problems with foundations and, and what gets dropped on the curbs and, and, and um, 
makes trip hazards and whatnot. So a little forethought has to go into things. So I really, um, my, uh, I want to give props to uh, Joe McCoolowitz, who's our ground supervisor, who, believe it or not, has a really good green thumb. He's done a lot of the plantings around the district and a lot of recommendations for plantings. Um, so when you walk them by, you see all these nice plantings and the flowers and the roses popping up, you could think of Joe. Um, so that I appreciate. Um, that's about it. Okay, uniforms, you're going to see there was a bump this year in uniforms because in the contract every five years we purchase new jackets. We did purchase these really nice um, jackets for the guys that are fluorescent because a lot of times uh, the custodians that are outside, for when they're outside, it's the worst uh, of time when it's snow and whatnot, so high visibility jackets are important, particularly when they're out on, on the main roads and people are maybe not as careful driving in the snow. Um, cell phone reimbursement for our... Um, our head custodians or for our maintenance personnel, um, shoe reimbursement, which is a contractual, and personal vehicle use if they, um, if they use their vehicle uh, for personal use, we'll uh, reimburse that. Um, the rest is um, trainings that we do. A lot of it we do online, which is great. Um, the guys can do it right on the computer um, and, and knock out a lot of that. We will send guys to training classes. We do make opportunities for the guys to go to other training classes. And I must really compliment my guys. When anytime we do a safety thing, CPR, AED, uh, Narcan, all our guys show up, you know, and they care. And you know what? That's important because they're here. They're here tonight. You know, I'm dropping here. I'm, you know, they're they're the ones that's going to be here. So that's a good thing. And, and and they do it. You know, they're good. They're they're good people, and they they do an excellent job, and they care. Um, supplies from Tears for the Lakefield Playground. It's shared costs, which I. I'm going to move you over to, we do a shared cost, which is an intermunicipal agreement with the town um, where we split costs for um, fields for uh, a, a half staff member and half the cost of uh, field supplies. Pretty simple, pretty straightforward. It's been there uh, 20 plus years as far as I know, that, that intermunicipal agreement, and I see no reason to change anything. Um, Oh, property lease, property lease, sorry about that. Um, we do uh, pay out of this budget. We pay for the uh, the rental up at uh, Sanborn for those offices, so that, that money has come out of there. Uh, don't know the accounting of that, but that doesn't reflect the total cost because there's a... Yeah, a so um, the full cost of the Sanborn lease is reflected in that line item, but a couple of years ago, um, the GASB came out with an accounting pronouncement that wants us to report it on a, set, on a different line within the budget, so we just have to classify part of that expense to a different budget line item. So it looks a little bit uh, artificially low, but there's another line that I think we're going to go over tonight that uh, I'll point it out to you when we get to it. Where that, and, uh, that happens in, I think, three different budget lines within across the budget, so we'll circle back to that. Also, if you look in the explanation, uh, there's mm -hmm. a little bit more yeah, yeah, yeah. more detail for uh, the folks on the right side. Yeah, yeah on B6. All right. Um, supplies for electrical, plumbing, hardware. So, you know, door hardware, locks, panic hardware. Um, they're all very expensive items, um, projects that we do, you know, on a daily basis. So replacing all this, uh, that's where that comes out of it. Uh, gas for um, our... Uh, Equipment, be it lawnmowers, tractors, the vans, pickup trucks, plow trucks. We do get uh, gas from a local gas station. We have a gas card that's issued to uh, individuals where they go purchase the gas uh, for that. Um, our diesel we purchase from Pelham Manor. We could take our. We do have a couple of diesel vehicles that we pick up diesel from Pelham Manor from from them. From uh, they have a gas pump at um, the firehouse over there. Um, I think that's it for the 6020 lines, and I think you want to touch on your 7140 lines. I do. Yeah. I do. I do. Mm -hmm. So it's D4. Mm -hmm. So D4 represents the, uh, the recreational salaries in there, you can see. Correct. Contractual services. Um, a lot of that is for uh, the, the turf fields, or repairing, cleaning the turf fields every year. Um, 
We do a we do a deep cleaning. We do we handle our the year long all year long we handle maintenance on the on the turf fields. But once a year we do have a company come in. They have a much more expensive heavier duty machine. It wouldn't be cost effective for us to own. Um, that does a deep cleaning. We will add uh, um, rubber to the fields as needed to make sure they pass G Max. Um, and, uh, and that's it. And then materials and supplies. There's your fifteen thousand. So we just purchase rubber for it. Um, but like to recap, like I said, year to year is one point four, considering you know increases to fuel, electric, and everything else, and cost of everything else going up. Um, you know, we take great pride in trying to do it as efficiently as possible. Um, we're historically low on overtime um, compared to, you know, if you go back in years, um, we do uh, all our painting in-house, um, which is another cost savings. We used to do um, turf replacement on all the fields every year, which 2018 was $40,000 a year, and we haven't um, expended that in my tenure here, and I'm in my start of my seventh year. So. Those are some of the things we try to do to cost effective. We're trying to get more automated to get um, more control of it. We do want to get back. I know uh, pre-COVID, we uh, got rid of paper towels to be more green. That was uh, the previous board's uh, directive, but we added back paper towels because then it was co under COVID. We, uh, we couldn't use hand dryers, so we'd like to get back to that because, quite frankly, paper towels are expensive, um, and they cause problems in our plumbing systems as well. So. That's all I have, and I'll handle any questions if I haven't spoken enough. Thank you. Okay. Thank, Thank you very you. much. Thank I you, John. appreciate your time. Thanks, John. Very Thank thorough. You. Thank you. And 1.4% increase. Yep. That was very con cost conscious. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. I always learn something new. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I sit next to him every day. Yeah. <laughs> and thank you, Jackie. Appreciate it. Yes. OK, thank you, John. Uh, next on our list is uh, the budget for the Board of Education and, and for Administration, uh, Dr. Champ, pages B1 and B2. Good. Not a huge section and not at all the jokes or the level of detail that you'll get from Mr. Condon. <laughs> hard, hard act to follow. Thanks, John. Um, all right, so just quickly, uh, really only two pages uh, in my section that relates to expenses from my office and supporting the Board of Education uh, and, uh, and uh, the vote in particular. So um, starting with uh, B1, 1010, 165, uh, that is some part-time clerical work uh, related to just supporting the, uh, the annual budget vote. We usually need, usually need some uh, additional uh, clerical support to help the, the clerk with that. Uh, moving into the contractual lines, uh, you see a decrease there. Uh, that's predominantly related to strategic planning. We had added in about 35,000 this year for strategic planning consultants. So we're spending that this year. That'll be a reduction next year. Um, we did add a couple other, uh, you know, offset that a little bit by some um, maintaining a little bit of additional funding for graphic design, figuring that we'll be rolling out the new strategic plan, so um, some additional monies there. Um, and then also in there, uh, as I'd mentioned in a prior meeting, we did uh, propose alternating uh, between the, uh, the scope survey, which was from the communications audit, versus the climate survey that we did this year. Um, so there's $2,000 in this line added to redo the scope survey. And again, the, the purpose of that was uh, we had some pretty good results in both. Um, wanted to, um, we've been implementing a lot of the recommendations of the audit this year, the communications audit. There were some, I would say, climate related concepts that came out of the survey in particular. So we had recommended putting that in as a way to benchmark to see if we've made some improvements as a result of, the, of that in the coming year. Um, so that explains the main changes in that line. Supplies and materials, very small changes. BOCI services, uh, again, this was the, the corollary to that. Um, we had built in through BOCES the climate survey that uh, we was presented to us back in January. That was about $39,000 cost. So the reduction you see there is largely related to that. Would the, I think we should consider, if we can, um, trying to maybe do a rerun of the climate survey this year, maybe not the full $39,000 Monty, but 
something, it feels like if we were to skip a year, waiting two years to update, just for me, feels like quite a long time. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if there were, if there were a way to, you know, do a check in on the climate survey to see directionally how people are feeling. Um, I think that would be a good a good thing to do. But if it, I agree, forty thousand dollars is a lot. Yeah. So I did reach out to them for updated pricing, given that this past year was the design year. Yeah. Um, so I don't know now that the tool has been designed if it's it would make sense that there's a cost reduction. Mm -hmm. um, so they 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 haven't gotten back to me with the price okay. yet. Um, but I know we were, being that we were in a much tighter budgeting perspective and knowing that there was some similarity, that was kind of our, our uh, initial you know, thought and best thinking on that. Fair but enough. No, would I certainly I accept the board's direction on where we want to go with that. I, I mean, if you could get it for a steal, I think it would be worth considering. Yeah. I remember the, the consultant expert mm -hmm. whom we spoke to, he said that you, you don't really want to do it more than once a year. And Correct. And once every other year isn't optimal either. So I think it's a useful tool, and if we could get it for a song, maybe we should do it. Um, any other thoughts on that before we move on, just so we know directionally, because and one thing, I and I know we didn't really preface it, but um, I know the board is aware of this, we'll say it for the public. Um, our next board meeting is our board adoption meeting. So um, as we go through lines budget. tonight, excuse me, budget, budget adoption, budget adoption um, it's gonna be really important for us to know any uh, any changes or adjustments that the board wants to see because we're going to have one finance meeting. I think um, Jim's going to be scheduling that hopefully yeah. between, well, we'd plan to do that between now and budget sure. adoption um, as one last chance to, mm -hmm. to really work together and massage and dig deep into it. And, but we want to be able to come back to you at our next meeting with a budget that everyone's prepared to uh, and comfortable with adopting. So um, just any other thoughts on that particular well, topic? I mean, I agree we will. We should, if we have budget, plan every year. Mm -hmm. And given that the two has been set up, I don't think they should charge us the same, right? Mm -hmm. Or um, can they give us a tool that we could roll out every year and then have consultation with them only as needed? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think do I know that <laughs> this year included not only the design, but uh, the follow-up presentation, et cetera. So I'm, I'm hoping as well that we can get a a lower cost. I mean, um, Principal Sabia has a, how frequently does she do her survey? Uh, that's annually. That's a very, very different tool yeah. and very different level of um, analysis. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. But still, so. the, the ethos of regular feedback, mm -hmm. I think, is a good one. Yeah, and I don't think it's anything we're opposed to. I think we're trying to be just really cost effective, especially given how positive the results were. And I think that was, you know, we, we saw more room for growth in the communications results um, than in the, the climate survey results. But um, certainly see what those numbers come back looking like. OK. okay. Um, moving on from that, um, district clerk stipend. Uh, the change there just reflects adjustments in the salary. Uh, that was to be a little bit more regionally competitive. We still are very, very uh, on, the, on the conservative side in that sense. Uh, but that's the reflection there. Um, moving into district meeting, that line is, that's where budget related to the vote uh, all stay. So we've maintained those uh, same as they were in prior years. They are pretty, uh, pretty close to on par. Um, moving then to, was that the, that was the last one on B1, right? Cover everything there. Oh, I, I, the other, no, that was it. Um, moving then on to B2. Um, this is the line, uh, my salary. So the change there reflects the, uh, uh, the, salary, that, uh, the salary adjustment that the board approved. Uh, clerical salaries, those are, I believe, three uh, that's, uh, the secretaries that directly support me. And part of that is also uh, shared, I believe it's with uh, Dr. Garcia's office. It's traditionally been split that way. I believe it's Patricia. Maria and I believe you. Valerie. <laughs> yes. <laughs> no. Isn't it salary or salary Sharon. 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 Okay, I'm sorry. That's it. Thank you. It was it was five o'clock before I had a chance to look at this, so I yeah, didn't have a chance to verify. I appreciate that. Um, and Sharon's our data analyst. 
So just to cover those salaries within the office. And just a reminder, too, that uh, Maria has really been working uh, predominantly supporting Alice Bowman uh, this year, because when we added that position, we did not add a clerical um, support direct to, for her. So Maria's been doing double duty for us um, as a, a way to, to contain costs there. Um, contractual expenses, um, the adjustments there, a little bit of a change from year to year um, to uh, really to, to more right size that. Uh, so in this category, you would see things like um, funding to support administrative retreats. Um, as the board knows, I've uh, accepted some leadership responsibilities in various professional organizations representing the district and the organizations. So that's added some increased contractual expenses in those lines as well. Um, in here, just to make sure I give you the right line, 124400, 124400. Um, also, any uh, additional consultants that we might bring in for uh, various work, um, whether it be uh, DEI, could be um, as we're at tonight's agenda. And one example, we're uh, approving um, and recommending school leadership to do an executive search to fill Dr. Bowman's role. So things like that. So there's some money in there for consultants that's added to that as well. Um, we wanted to try to right size those costs. Supplies and materials, um, really uh, not a significant budget to budget increase a little bit there. And that is, again, just to right size based on the needs of the office. And I think that's actually really all of my lines. Make sure I get everything. Yes, those are really the notes that I wanted to highlight. Is there any questions in there? Okay, thank you, Dr. Champ. That's it. Next, next up is our human resources personnel, Dr. Garcia. Uh, the same section, page B4. Right, so on uh, B4, the first item is legal, um, which is an HR, but it does HR work. That is our contractual expenses with our attorneys as specified at the bottom of the page. The legal counsel is utilized for employee contractual relations, labor relations, with four collective bargaining units, and so forth and so on. Um, the next code, 1430-150, is the salary for executive director for HR and leadership. 1430-158 uh, is the line where um, it's the salary increases, the estimated salary increases for the non-contractual, non-represented folk in the district. Right, um, and they're not covered on the collective bargaining agreement, and the final final salary adjustments are always subject to and determination of discretion of the board of education. Uh, Fourteen thirty one sixty, the salary for uh, my clerical assistant, um, and as you remember that last year, this is not part of this line, but we explained this I think under the staffing. We were hoping to have a um, a part time person added and uh, to assist, and then also a full-time clerical support to directors, right? We moved the recommendation is then just to make that a half-time person for the directors, and then have the other part of that job work with me to try to contract that line a little bit. Um, 1430-200, the equipment line for the office. 1430-400, um, contractual expenses. Um, that are necessary for the office, usually uh, for recruitment purposes. Um, and then 1430, 450, the material supplies for the office. Um, the last line on this page, 1480, 160 is the salary for the public information officer. Okay, thank you. Uh, if we can, uh, they'll try to take us home. If we go back one page to B3, we'll start with business administration office. Starting uh, top line is the salary for the assistant superintendent for business, uh, followed by the salaries for the clerical staff in the office. Uh, we have some contractual expenses, uh, generally related to um, ACA compliance, postage, bid fees, conferences, memberships. Uh, and then finally, uh, Supplies and materials, paper, checks, things like that. And then uh, the bottom line is our annual auditing fee. Uh, but again, we have our external auditor, we have our internal auditor, and whenever we pay a bill, we have to go, we have a claims auditor. So, and that's usually twice a month as well. 
So um, pretty regulated. We've got, uh, and those are all contractual services uh, through CPA firms that we have. Um, Dr. Garcia mentioned about uh, legal, so and public information. On page B7, we have some of our contractual expenses, district-wide contractual expenses. <coughs> uh, again, we've got uh, unallocated insurance. As you look at that, it's a little bit of a, a jump. The last two years in insurance, uh, we, were, we were a little bit behind on that increase in the current year, so there's a little bit of a catch-up in this year's um, insurance, but at the same time, I think what we're hearing is the same as what many other people are hearing. Uh, there's some difficulties in the insurance market right now, uh, and, and uh, the cost is going up. I mean, we're, we're seeing that, and I think homeowners are seeing that, and uh, vehicle owners are seeing that. It's just a difficult insurance market. So uh, we've, we've seen that as well. Uh, we've certainly uh, expressed that dissatisfaction to, uh, we work with the consortium, the New York Schools Insurance Reciprocal, so it's nice. It's a cooperative of school districts that started in 1980, uh, working with an insurance company that works on school districts' behalf to really try to work and get good insurance policies specifically uh, tailored for school districts. So uh, w the good thing is is they, there's folks that sit on that board that are members of school districts. So uh, they're their purpose and the goal is really to provide the best services and prices to school districts. So uh, when, when things like this happen, we really have that opportunity to sit down and push hard and push hard back. So that's, uh, I just want to let you know when you see those things, if those aren't things that we just uh, willingly accept, we certainly question those things and we, and we learn more about that as well. Uh, other items in there are school association dues, if there's any uh, judgments and claims. Again, as you can see, they're uh, minor, minor items. Uh, we are tax exempt, but we still do, it says sewer taxes, but it's really, think of it as more of a use fee. So uh, we, we are exempt from property taxes, but we do pay for um, sanitary sewer. Uh, that's, a, that's a cost that's incurred by us that's a, for the service. Uh, and then lastly, uh, you see on the bottom the BOCES administrative charges. Uh, that really pertains to the base charge since we are a member of BOCES, we are a part of BOCES. Uh, they have a base uh, cost to operate co to, to operate BOCES, and this is really that base cost. And then the other parts that we've talked about in the BOCES section really talks about the various services that we procure through BOCES as part of that cooperative uh, program. Uh, next, we have uh, our attendance and building safety on C25. Listed, on, it listed as attendance on the tab. Again, we have uh, salaried uh, monitors, and then we have uh, hourly monitors. Uh, this year, uh, what you'll see is our estimated expenditures related to our uh, request for next year, slightly less, or sli slightly more this year versus uh, current year. Right now, we, we have had some people uh, that we've, we've wanted, that have left, and we've been working to replace. So uh, we anticipate filling those positions and uh, needing those dollars to fill those uh, safety monitor positions. And then there's a small amount there for uh, contractual expenses if there's a larger event, uh, say a football game, a prom, a di different thing like that, uh, Halloween, uh, we may ask a police officer to uh, be present at the event, and uh, this is the account we would use to pay for uh, that particular event. After that, we're on D1, Pupil Transportation Services. And for a district that doesn't bus, we've got a pretty good <laughs> transportation budget. Uh, and really, we, uh, our transportation is on, on two major items, which is uh, athletics uh, so, and, and charter trips for, for athletics. And the other is for uh, transportation related to Pelham students who are entitled to be transported to uh, the school outside of Pelham if their parents choose to send their students to a school outside of Pelham. So uh, April 1st was the cutoff date, so we've, we're, we've received all that information. We're going through that right now. Um, if there's any variances, we'll try to reflect that when we come uh, to the Finance Committee and the final board for the final budget. And uh, what we do is we provide 
again, as, as required by state law, the district has to provide transportation for uh, students that, uh, that request that transportation. District's preferred transportation is uh, by policy, is by public transit. So as you'll see, there's a breakdown uh, in a cost in schools by, by student uh, of what we expect you know, for each student for next year based on those being transported by public transit. And then when they cannot be transferred, transported, transported either in a timely manner or in a safe manner, uh, then the yellow bus is the uh, method of transportation. And we've, we kind of have it, you can kind of see an idea of uh, that breakdown in the expense. Uh, and one person in my office, half of their job works as the transportation coordinator. So it's a, it's a split, it's a 5.5.5 position. So that's when you see salaries there and you it may be asking yourselves, who is that? Uh, that's what we have. And we also, uh, when we have students that travel on yellow bus, uh, we do try to defray, defray that cost. We work with BOCES, so they have a coordinator of uh, school transportation. And then we try to share services, and we share services with Bronxville, East Chester, and Tuckahoe, so that, uh, say, if we have, if we each have one student traveling to, uh, let's, let's pick a school, um, uh, Sacred Heart in, in uh, Greenwich, Connecticut, uh, we don't each have to send a yellow bus. We would send one bus, and we'd each uh, have each, our students on that bus, and then we would share that cost on a per student basis. Mm -hmm. So it's, again, it's, a, it's an attempt, and, and we've, we've had success in trying to defray that cost, so that's, that's helpful as well. You see on the bottom line, contract transportation fuel. Uh, we're in year, we're gonna be going into year two of our new contract. Uh, the last contract did, did not include fuel, and that was an added charge. This new contract did include fuel, so uh, in some ways, it, that was very good because that takes a lot of risk out of what we expect to happen in the transportation and the fuel market. So that's why you kind of see the zero out. It depends on how the contract is awarded. We, um, working with BOCES, last year they put the bid out two different ways, with, with fuel and without fuel, and then based on the, fuel submi the bid submissions, they'll evaluate and see which is most advantageous to the districts. Okay, that's uh, all on student transportation. Our next item to discuss or to go through is um, employee benefits, which can be found on D5 through 8. Hmm. And employee benefits is really made up of uh, retirement, so uh, pension. So we participate in two pension plans uh, as required uh, for school districts. So we have uh, many employees that participate in the teacher's retirement system uh, for educational and, and uh, certified teaching staff and administrators. And then for all others, they participate in the uh, employee retirement system. And that is for, uh, say, our, our clerical staff, our maintenance staff, um, and uh, those that don't have a, a state certification from state ed. Uh, the amount we pay to that state retirement system is based on an, a, a percentage established by each board of those retirement systems. And if you look to the right in the explanation, you can see the variance of how it's established. So uh, the top one is the state retirement. So the ERS rate cost has increased from 13.1% uh, of an employee's salary to 15.2% of that, em of that employee's salary from, for this year to next year. So uh, what we're, what's happening in the budget, obviously, is we're capturing the cost of the increase in that contribution rate. And then if there's any contractual increases associated to that employee uh, by collective bargaining agreement, you might catch, you're gonna catch a little bit of that as well. Um, and you, as you see, that's a 16% increase there. Uh, if you go a little bit lower on the teacher's retirement, you see that rate is also increasing from 9.76% of the employee's salary to 10.02% of the employee's salary. So uh, what we try to do, again, is uh, when we build the budget, and uh, this is something we shared in finance committee, uh, we, we look at every employee, we look at every what, what pension plan every employee participates in, uh, what their Social Security, Medicare contribution would be, what their expected pension contribution would be, and that's how we uh, determine all of these costs when we build up the budget every year. So it's not like we take a, 
and we kind of take a general number for everybody and allocate it out. We actually build up every, we go person by person and uh, try to determine that cost. And we do that with uh, health insurance as well. So as you go down on the sheet, you'll see social security. Uh, th there's a, a little bit uh, bigger increase there this year that you'll see. Uh, social security has raised the base growth from 100, uh, the base limit from 160,000 to $168,000. So there's really, um, just about everybody's gonna end up paying Social Security for the full year that we'll see. So you used to be able to catch a little bit of a break there. Uh, we have our worker compensations, in insurance, um, unemployment. Um, as you can see, uh, for co during COVID we received the credit, so we're still working on, on we've, we've had some favorable experience there too as well. And then we have health insurance. Uh, we have seen an increase this year. Um, and it also, as you look at that category, you'll see that that, that particular line does include some um, contingency dollars associated with the collective bargaining agreement negotiations. So it doesn't, that's not the, the, the year to year line expense expected for that particular, item, that particular line item. So as you look at that, you'd say, wow, that looks really big. It is. Uh, and then that's, that's the reason uh, for that though. But we participate in a Swiss chip, which is another consortium or cooperative run program with other school districts. Uh, comparative, comparative program is the NICE ship program. Uh, we, again, we, in finance committee, we shared some more an additional information, kind of looking at a comparative between those two programs over the last few years. Um, the participation in Swiss chip has proved, proven to be more favorable than participation in the NICE ship program. Um, also, uh, Swiss ship is a smaller, a smaller consortium. Uh, which also has allowed us, and as a district and other school districts, we have representation on that board. So uh, you have superintendents who are on that, on that board. You have um, labor unit leaders, so you have teachers, you have CSCA leaders, people who uh, understand business officials, so people understand the pressures of school districts, the financial pressures, and really trying to uh, meet those demands as well. So when, when you see increases, we certainly um, were reactive to that. And those are, those are good things, I think, that help us get better services and help us try to temper that growth. Last we heard, we, there's, we're hearing that that costs we should be leveling, or they're seeing it level off a little bit. Prescription drug is still a little bit more in what's driving cost. Uh, but the medical side of it, they're seeing leveling off a bit. So that's, that's favorable. Um, we're, we're always hopeful, but again, you don't know what's, we don't know what's gonna happen with, with people's choices and that, what, what can happen. Um, years ago, I was at the, with the organization that was self-insured. Uh, this time of year was always nerve wracking when you, when you close at year end, you never knew what your weekly claims were gonna be. So being in a, kind of like a fully insured plan like this with the, or with a larger consortium creates a lot of stability too, which is I think very advantageous for the district. Uh, lastly, we have our employee benefit funds. Some of our collective bargaining agreements also have stipulations for contributions into uh, welfare funds, which really are, are what pay for uh, those collective bargaining, agreement, uh, bargaining unit members' dental and vision insurance. So these are uh, set, set by the collective bargaining agreement. So that's what we have there. And uh, the bottom line we have is there are certain incentives for people that give us advance notice of retirement, uh, and, and that's... Uh, that kind of that placeholder. Some years it's, it's greater than that, some years it's, it's lower than that. And again, we're crystal balling it a little bit. So it's, we, we're kind of steady on our year to year unless there's something we really know about what's happening there. Uh, after benefits, uh, last is uh, debt service, pages D9 through D11. And debt service is really, um, you think about it, if you kind of associate it to your home life, it's kind of what, what you, your, your payments for what you've borrowed. So like your mortgage payments or something, or when we built Hutchinson School, uh, the district borrowed money and we had to pay debt service on that. So uh, as you can see, uh, the preliminary, preliminary budget, uh, you have the debt service payment of $6.5 million. Uh, we break it down by what's principal and what's interest. Uh, as Jackie mentioned earlier, a little bit more information there on the lease, mm -hmm. as you see up there on, on the top part, it, mm -hmm. by the GASB 87 pronouncement. Is this the bulk of the lease cost in, on this page? Correct. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So those top two lines that you see, the uh, yep. 9788, 
that's basically that reallocation of expense. So instead of seeing it up in that 1620 line and a couple of other lines, this is where you have to, sh to reflect it. Okay, great. Gatsby. Thank you. Makes it so much clearer. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's why we have Gatsby. And again, if you look further along, you can kind of see uh, the, there's really five uh, bonds that uh, the district is paying back. And we have uh, the detail and the charts kind of sharing with, with you in the budget kind of what the principal and interest in total is on each of those bonds and the duration of each of those. So again, that's the principal and interest. When every year we get state aid, so state aid gets pulled, then comes off of that number. Right. And then what's left there is what's part of the tax cap formula. And then, um, then if you have debt service fund, you can apply debt service fund or you would tax to raise funds for that to, uh, to pay that portion of it. So that's our, our debt service center inter, inter fund transfers. And that was the last page that I had here. Oh, just, you know, again, we're S&P rated, AAA. Um, you know, it's funny, when you look at the last two bond series, the, two, the 2020 bonds, Jackie and I, we were reviewing before the meeting and we were talking about about this, because you see that the second to right one, that it was a refunding of the 2010 bond. Um, we had an opportunity to refund it in 2019, but in order to do that, we were gonna have to get a, um, a re-rating from S&P, which of course incurs a cost, mm -hmm. and really it, it, the numbers, the savings numbers really, they were there, but they really weren't significant to the district. And uh, working with the board at that time, uh, the, the, the decision was let's let's push it a year because we knew we were going to go out for a large bond the following year and we're going to have to get an S&P rating. So uh, fortunately, uh, we, we the savings was still there in the refunding the following year. We paid for one refunding or for one ratings uh, from S&P and we ended up uh, doing much better than we would have if we had done it the prior year. So uh, if we don't if we don't say it, nobody will know it. But uh, again, it was. It was just, a, it was a nice opportunity because again, if you look at it, we did it in 2020 and now there's just two more years left on that. So there wasn't a lot of time left on that uh, bond. So that, the, the bond for Hutchinson School and the other projects was the 54 million? Correct, correct. Uh, it was, I think a $57.1 million bond, but we ended up borrowing the 54 and some some other amounts came back in the form of what's called a bond premium, which then uh, goes into the debt service fund and helps you being used to def defray the cost of uh, debt service. And there's rules on how you have to use those premiums, which we have to follow. Hey, Jim, and I, just correct me if I'm wrong in this, I know we often talk about kind of the where are there potential drops in debt service mm -hmm. as different, uh, b different borrowings are paid off. We know that there's gonna be a small drop after the 2020 drops off, payments for the, sorry, I'm really tired, so words are not coming out smoothly. Um, the 2020 bond series B that's finished off in 25, 26. So 26, 27. Right, so there could be potentially a small decrease yeah. in debt payment. Right. But the bigger one that we always tend to look at is we've got uh, two of those that are dropping off, uh, last payment being in the 29-30 school year. Correct. Right, so that, as far as looking for where are bigger opportunities to potentially... You kind of call it keyholing it a little bit. Keyholing, yes. If you're looking to have uh, a lesser impact to the taxpayer so that they're not seeing an increase or a decrease, right. it's kind of yeah. uh, steady as she goes. Yeah. Uh, again, you're looking at about, in principal and interest, you're looking about two point, uh, what, six, two point seven million dollars rolling off in that year. That's right. In which, in which, in twenty nine twenty, in twenty nine thirty is when it would be rolling off. So, uh, the following year is when you would. You could potentially have a look for a, a, yeah. a new bond or bond neutral, mm -hmm. a tax neutral borrowing opportunity. And again, as you look at this, there's also the state aid portion of it. So. Sometimes that state aid can fall off earlier or later uh, as well. So that, that's a timing thing. And we work with uh, capital markets. CMA, Capital Markets Advisors. Uh, they're very good as far as helping us forecast that, uh, that state aid uh, and building aid units so that we have a good understanding of, of what we can see. And they were the ones who we worked with on the 2018 bond as well. And I think we did pretty well there. Again, if you look at the rates, 
Fa fantastic. I mean, the low of uh, 1.68 or, well, 0.38, but that was a shorter term. Uh, the 2020 bond for, for Hutchinson, uh, the total interest cost of 2.53%. So, we, and again, there are different durations. The, the Hutchinson portion has a 30-year duration. Um, like the turf field would have a 10-year duration. There's, there's rules on different durations, but again, the, uh, that weighted interest rate is, was really great. We had, we had a very good timing and the market was uh, worked well for the, for the district. The, the building aid reimbursements that you were just talking about, are those contractual or pseudo contractual or are they like at the whim of the budget? Uh, the, the building aid units as of now are, are pretty prescribed up in Albany. They can that, always change. That was my understanding. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, they can always change, right? We know they can always change. Uh, but yes, there's, there's, there's a pretty prescribed way for, for it to be done. Right. And, and uh, we've got a pretty good uh, building aid rate, which is favorable to us. What's not favorable to us, obviously, is just very expensive to build in this part of the state. And I, I thought it was important to highlight those things because I know in our, our financial goal for the year, part of it's understanding our facilities needs, but part of it's also understanding our financial tools uh, and opportunities, whether it's uh, analysis of reserves, which I know we've spent a lot of time on as well, as understanding what uh, potential borrowing uh, options could be in the future to help continue to address our facilities needs. All right. Thank you. Uh, again, uh, I thank the Finance Committee, the Board and the Finance Committee. Uh, finance Committee was kind enough to come in at 8 o'clock in the morning on Monday. <laughs> so we, uh, we, we had a, at least an hour-long meeting. I, I think we broke Will's heart stop, unfortunately. Uh, but again, we've had an opportunity to go through the book, I think, in uh, a little bit more detail, have uh, more detailed conversation and more detailed conversation kind of collectively of where we are economically. Uh, I think what we're seeing as a district, what we're seeing in the region. Uh, the state budget was supposed to be set by April 1st. That was our meeting. Well, there's no state budget. Uh, now I think they're saying maybe this week. I think we'll know when we know. <laughs> and I, it sounds like a Yogi Bearism when you say that. Uh, but they're going to they're gonna come to a decision when when they're able to come to decision. And I think the biggest, the biggest points as I hear it are still Medicare, Medicaid, and educational funding. So those are, those are the, the, the hard points that they're dealing with right now. Uh, as, again, as we look at it, we know that there's pressure, uh, kind of status of things that we've seen since the budget has been uh, pushed out. Uh, we've seen some greater pressure in special education and pupil personnel services. Uh, as we look at this right now, uh, we expect, with with pretty good degree of um, certainty, that we're going to have um, two more out of district placements that were not known to the district prior to uh, the formulation of the budget. Uh, so that's that's something that we have to think about, um, and then you have to think about how are you going to pay for that, because there's there's different mechanisms, but we want to have a tax cap compliant budget. Um, other things have happened, right? We look at the economic indication indicators, what's happening out there. Uh, I think when we built the budget, we've been hearing a lot of news that interest rates were going to start, were really going to start dropping. Uh, I think at that point, the Fed was kind of, fig people were kind of figuring about six, six uh, rate reductions. Uh, now we're seeing, we're hearing that that's going to slow a bit, maybe three or four. Uh, so with that slow down of interest rate, uh, interest rate drops, I think there's an opportunity for us to look at interest interest income. Uh, as a way to, to uh, address that for, uh, for special education. Um, but I think we have to be careful about that. Again, conversations with, with finance committee, we know interest income isn't going to be there forever, and we've got to be mindful of how we, uh, how we build cost and program in a sustainable way. Yeah. Can I pick up on that? Please, yeah. Thank you. Um, I mean, as, as we sort of conclude this, and as always, Thank you, Jackie, for putting all these materials together and your team. It's always really, really impressive. Um, I, you know, I think that thematically, when we think about the, the budget, we decided this year, or the guidance we gave this year was to 
sort of pause, we'll try and, you know, um, decelerate growth in expenditure. And I think we've done that. Um, there's really no addition of headcount. There's very little addition of, of programming. You know, it's sort of pretty much a treading water budget. And yet, even by adding no heads and no programming, just because of the many, many factors that go into this budget, the sort of the cost of operating the district is up 5% year over year. And then you compare that against what the proposed tax increases, which I'm sorry, I can't remember, is it 3.5? 2.68. Sorry, 2.68, right? So the costs are going up 5%. We're increasing taxes by only 2.68. So something has to kind of fill that gap. And what fills that gap are reserves, which, is, um, which are kind of finite. Um, interest income, which is out of our control, and you can't count on that for very long. Um, and the third thing is state aid that, you know, is, again, out of our control. Um, and so it feels to me we have to sort of have this conversation around how sustainable is what I just described. You know, expenses outpacing the revenue sources that we can control. And for me, the, a couple of sort of conclusions come from this. The first is, you know, I think when we were discussing this year's budget, we talked about, you know, this year should be, you know, very conservative in terms of increasing expenses, right? We should try and, de you know, cap the expense growth as much as possible. And um, I don't think that is a one-year project. I think that is probably becoming a multi-year project. Now, obviously, we'll see what comes out of the strate strategic plan, and I wouldn't want to say that we would, you know, no investment in anything ever, but at least, you know, when you look at the broad indicators and the broad sort of traje trajectory of the, of the cost and the revenue lines, I think that this, this year's kind of hold in place, trade water is probably not, like I say, a, a multi-year exercise rather than a one-year exercise. Um, I guess the other thing is, as we go into the strategic plan, maybe we should be having some full and frank discussions around certain programming where, you know, ultimately it's just perhaps it's, it's harder to justify it. You know, maybe there are pockets of things that we offer in the school district to our students that, um, you know, just perhaps aren't being used as much as we anticipated they would. Um, and so I think we should not be afraid to have you know, some of those conversations. But I guess one thing that's good news, um, or at least may provide some relief, is you know, when I was running for this position, one of the themes in the election was, you know, I can't remember the exact stat, but it was like 30% you know, of our teachers are going to retire in the next three or four years. Whatever. We haven't seen that happen yet. Um, and it, I believe that there's quite a large body of employees who are fairly you know, very, very deep into their careers. They will be retiring in the coming year or two or three, uh, and that will perhaps sort of give us a, a little bit of breathing room. Um, so those are my kind of concluding thoughts on the budget. Um, and uh, if anyone wants to disagree with me or agree with me, please feel free to do so. I, I agree that the, the, str the strategic plan and sort of what the, the future of the workplace looks like with the retirements are the sort of opportunities that are non, not draconian in, in terms of managing the budget growth moving forward. And um, so it's good that we are talking about that now and um, appreciate that we're keeping that in mind moving ahead. I mean, I know there's been some analysis done externally by how we stack up in terms of growth versus other districts. How would we respond, um, you know, if we are higher, or lower, just how, how would we respond to where we are relative to growth trajectories of other districts? I think to accurately do that, you'd really have to unpack every district, to be perfectly honest. Yeah. Um, some districts have been overfunded by formula of state, uh, according to the state formula. Pelham hasn't been. So I think the last few years, when 
that state funding finally became available to Pelham, Pelham was able to catch up and add program that they had been holding, on, holding back on for many years uh, prior to that. I mean, if you think about it, if all these programs existed before the tax cap, they would have been built in already. You know, and, and that's, those, those are things where maybe the district uh, lost out on having those other things that have been added all those prior years. But it, it's, it's hard to say what's, what are the demographics in each community? Yeah. Uh, are they seeing inflows or outflows of students? What are the demands of the students? Uh, what are, what's your student need uh, for your pupil personnel and your special education? Uh, that's why uh, it, it would be, again, I think you'd really want to do a thoughtful uh, analysis of each one and breaking it down to really see what's going to drive each district. Because again, we've, we've got our, obviously the largest, the largest uh, revenue source is your tax levy. Uh, some districts, it's state aid. In other districts, it's, it's barely a portion of what they have. Uh, interest income was was really nothing up until the last two years, uh, which is great. And um, but now again, we're seeing the, the Fed's going to bring it back back down. And that's, they've been very clear about their uh, their intentions there. Uh, we've adjusted some of our spending so that we go through revenue-based aid with BOCES programs where we can to try to uh, help those costs and and mitigate some of those costs, and that's been helpful as well and we try to adjust our strategies. The, the hard part is, is the, the tax cap really puts just about every organization that, is, uh, that has to follow the tax cap on, on a pathway where they're sooner or later going to have to face the, the idea of breaking a cap. And really, the goal is, you, don't, you want to put that off until you really need, it, need to do that, uh, because you have, you're, you're going back for a big ask to your voters. And uh, you want to make sure you really have to you really have to do that at that point in time. Number of school districts are going out and breaking a ca and, and going to break a cap this year. Uh, some of them have been affected by the state aid, and that's what they're using it for. But there's other districts before the state aid um, fell apart. They were they were going out to break caps, and some were successful and others weren't. Uh, and I think early on more were unsuccessful because I think it was the newness of the cap and I think part of the education process and, and people understanding the tax cap a little bit better is that uh, the tax cap does do a good job of kind of getting a good restraint on expenses and really putting more eyes on it. Um, but it does make it very difficult because if, if health insurance goes up 10%, what are we going to do if, if uh, a thousand kids move, this is ridiculous, but a thousand kids move into the district what are you going to do? You have to educate those students. If students need special services, we're going to provide those special services. Tax cap doesn't provide any of those exceptions. So mm -hmm. it's, it's just, again, it's, it's now that we're year 12, 13, 14 at tax cap, we, we have a better idea of what to expect from it year in and year out. Uh, we certainly respect it, and, we, and we, I, think, uh, I think we're doing the right thing in having a tax cap compliant budget personally. Uh, but again, it's, it's just, it's a process. We, you know, we do our five-year forecast every year, and that's, that's part of what we have to do. And part of that process is to make the board and, the, and everyone aware, all right, this is what, what, what we can see, this is what you could see happening, mm -hmm. up or down. Uh, and it helps, it, again, it's a tool. All these things are tools. Yeah. <clears throat> I'll stop. Thank you. <laughs> So I, I guess sort of just specifically as we talk about interest income that was a windfall that kind of came out of nowhere and we've been using it, you know, on valuable things. You know, when that evaporates, I guess you've got two options. You either, um, either increase taxes um, or I guess you could dip into reserves briefly, but that has a, you know, finite impact as well. Mm -hmm. Or you try and bring your expenses down. And... I suppose what I'm sort of trying to figure out is like what should we, which of those should we be signaling to the community so no one is surprised? Is it a combination of all, you know, of, of all of those things? It, you know, yeah. do we lean on one? Do we lean on the other? Um, I, I don't know what the answer is, but um, do you have any kind of guidance for, for people listening? You know? Well, I think every year brings its challenges and what could be a cost driver this year could provide savings next year. Uh, Jackie shares the example with me with uh, our pension contribution. It was really high at one point and then it dropped and that helped fund programs uh, pr 
prior, prior to my arrival here. Uh, so things, things can change year up and year down. Uh, you made an interesting point, though. We talked about fund balance, and we're, we're, we've, our fund balance is strong. And if there are going to be changes, I think organizationally, I think the district is in a strong position that you're not forced to do anything immediately uh, because you have the benefit of fund balance. And that allows you to make thoughtful uh, and deliberate decisions and changes if you have to, uh, where you, you can really work hard to have, uh, you know, again, nobody wants to hurt students. We want, we want the best opportunity, the best experience for our students. And I think that um, having that really provides that, that buffer, if you will, that could really help the district. If you have to make those changes, it, allow, it allows you to do that. Uh, and it may be a combination of all those things, right? We're looking at cutting back, pruning a tree, pruning a program, um, you know, different things like that. Yeah, I mean, I, I know some people have been focused on the interest mm -hmm. issue, but I mean, to me, that's like a, a million dollar delta, and there's so many other items in the budget that are bigger movers. I mean, you know, health insurance is like $2 million increase this year. So like trying to budget based on the interest number just doesn't feel like the right place to focus so much. It's an issue and like one that we're aware of and so something we can um, be forward thinking about, but it's, it, to me, it's not really the driver for like whether we're gonna be able to balance it next year or not. T totally, and, and I guess I was using interest income only to illustrate, I think, one of the things I've learned on the Finance Committee, which is don't fund, it is dangerous to fund recurring expenses from revenue sources that are not recurring. Mm -hmm. And whether that is interest, sure, interest income, I suppose, is just an example I use because it is so variable, right? I mean, it can change from month to month, from quarter to quarter. So I just use that as a particularly volatile um, revenue source, even though it's not that large. Um, I guess just, the, you know, again, thematically funding, funding, ex you know, recurring expenses from revenue sources which you don't control or have a finite nature to them is, is the kind of concept that I'm sort of poking at. Yeah. 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 I guess um, also thematically, um, when I think about the budget, you know, we've talked about this a bunch of times over the period, but, you know, we're talking 80% about people costs and, you know, more than 90% of that is, or, you know, less than 10% of that is administration. So the people who are actually interacting with our kids are 90% or more of that. So like, you know, un unless people think that the right answer is we're gonna, you know, really change the nature of the schools and cut program or not have you know, there's not really much you can do on, most of those people are under union contracts, but like, you know, the alternatives would be cut program, like really fight with the teachers on their salary negotiations to a point that you're like really slashing things, in which case you're not gonna have a competitive school district in terms of, you know, getting good teachers. There are, um, their constraints around what we can do to try and really, in the long term, like Jim was talking about, to stay under a 2% every year yeah. tax cap budget. And so people have to be thoughtful about that and where we care about program, like you were saying about whether there are areas of the program that maybe are, are not um, as value add to the student body and then that we have other things that we were talking about, you know, there are a lot of younger parents who would like to see um, more kindergarten classes, and that's not something that we had room for in this budget, but something that, you know, maybe we continue to think about, and if we want to do that, there's going to be a trade-off somewhere else. So this is all, in some ways, zero-sum, but, um, but trying to do the best we can with what we have. Yeah. Yeah, and I, in, I think starting with our first public comment is a perfect example. Uh, Mr. Sinta, yeah. wonderful. I, I, I love listening to him because he's got such a rich history yes. of the district. Um, but that, that's a perfect example of, you know, as we head into strategic planning and we know that we've got these kinds of budget constraints in front of us because of the cap and because of 
uh, volatility of funding and all that, all these dynamics. There's a lot on, so many moving parts on the revenue side and so many moving parts on the expenditure side, identifying those long-term priorities and pointing the direction for us in these next few years is gonna be critically mm -hmm. important because I think, as you said, this is a long-term event. This is not a one-year uh, fix. We, you know, we, we make adjustments year by year and each district has their own story about mm -hmm what led to their current decisions about their budget each year. But knowing that long-term vision and direction, I think is gonna be critically important for us in trying to find what are all of those priorities, how do we put them together to make the best mix possible to, as you said, to provide the, the, the best education for our students moving forward, because that is what we're all about. And I know what every person around this table is about that same thing. So, um, next couple months are gonna really help us. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. I mean, to pick up on your point about, um, you're right, sort of 75, 80% of our expenses, whatever the number is, it always escapes me, is, is people cost. And the, you know, the, I guess the, one of the characteristics of that cost is it's very hard to change short term. You know, it's not a variable, it's, it's not a variable cost. You can't just, you know, wake up one morning and decide to bring your headcount down 10%, you know, it, that's not how a district should function. Or if it finds itself in that position, then it's been doing yeah, something wrong problems. for quite a long yeah. time. <laughs> so I guess that's sort of why I was, and again, this is only my, my opinion, that my kind of outlook over the next, you know, couple of years is um, to be pretty, is you know, to be really judicious in terms of adding more cost on the headcount side um, only because once it's there, it's very hard to, yep. to to reverse. And again, this is not me saying we should not invest. I'm, I don't want to sort of get tactical about any of this. I'm just saying thematically, um, when you see other districts breaking the tax cap, you know, to maintain excellence in their districts, if you want to defer that, you probably want to be very judicious in in, in hiring. So. Do you think this is a sustainable budget or, cause I, I mean, the budget to budget change is 2.68, which is the tax levy percent increase, right? So the, ex the expense portion of the budget, again, that's, that's different than the levy, but the, yeah. the levy increase is 2.68% year to year. But the budget to budget change is 2.68 percent. Yeah. Oh, actually, they wound up being the same they, this yeah. year. But I mean, they match. <laughs> yeah, so that's they why do I'm match. saying it's. <laughs> yeah. In um, that sense, it is. It, it was. I, I think uh, last in last year's budget there was that two million dollars for capital expense, yep. which is not in this year's budget. So, uh, I think if you no. want to do a, a, an apples to apples to compare comparison, you'd really uh, you would probably need to take that, 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 that out. It's closer yeah. to. If you yeah. take that out, it's closer to 5%. Okay, because the budget to actual is 4.88. Right, yeah. But that's even including that 2 million, I guess. Or Sorry, which part? So the, the budget to actual is 4.88%. I don't know, do you think we should look at the budget to actual or the budget to budget? This is a perennial question. Mm -hmm. yeah. which we give it to you. I think we give it to you every, every which way. We give you budget to budget, budget to expense. You know, budget to expense. Uh, I think as you look at a comparative, it, budget to budget is is really what's probably most comparable uh, as as you look at it because that's really what you're voting. You're voting on the budget on, on what that what that's going to be. And again, this is this is the budget to accomplish. The, the programs and policies of the board for the year. That's that's the this is the implementation tool. But I guess if we're policies. thinking about kind of long term sustainability, I don't know. Because um, if if we just we could say budget to budget each year goes up like a pretty small percentage, but the budget to actual is much larger. I don't. It seems like the rate of growth is actually. You know, the budget to budget is kind of understating. The well, I mean, growth. your actual is gen is usually a little bit le less than what what you budgeted every year. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, mm -hmm. Again, we have a two percent contingency yeah, that we, we build into the budget. Right. Yeah, um, and uh, I'd have a lot less hair if we um, spent to the budgeted amount every year because again, like, that's <laughs> that's not something you can do. Yeah. Right. Uh, I just can't go over it. 
I guess I'm just thinking, because you said with the tax cap mm -hmm. environment, almost every government entity at some point will have to break the tax cap. So, like, does that mean, I mean, <laughs> then that makes me start thinking what year do we have to break the tax cap or are we trying, like, is that, I guess that's our strategic question. Are we going to plan at some point that we are going to break this tax cap or are we, is our strategic plan, you know, to somehow contain things and stay within the tax cap for the foreseeable future? That's certainly been our goal mm -hmm. <laughs> every year yeah. is to push that, to continue to push and push and push and to avoid reaching that cliff as long as possible. And the guidance from the board every year mm -hmm. uh, is, very, is very clear. Mm -hmm. yeah. Tax cap compliant budget. Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, yeah, and that's, that's what we strive to do. So but but it, again, I think as we look at our certain costs and certain uh, state requirements and laws that you have to follow, uh, that can grow faster than 2% a year. Mm -hmm. and, it, and you don't have a choice of whether you want to pay them or not. You have to pay them. Those, yeah, it yeah. it kind of strikes me, because I've never thought of it this way, as I, I'd be curious what econ economists would say, but it's kind of a price control that, you know, I think my understanding is price controls don't work, and we've now set a price control on the price of public education, <laughs> essentially. And we've got all, all the other prices that we're paying are, you know, uncontrolled. Yeah, so uncontrolled. eventually it's going to blow up. But, okay. Anyway, <laughs> thank, thank you. And these are things that <laughs> business <laughs> officials and superintendents uh -huh. and, and boards grapple with. Mm -hmm. yeah. yes. I think that's it. I mean, we're, we're charged, again, with providing the best experience for our students. And, we want to be able to do and that. I would say, you know, kind of to that point, every year, you know, when we, and I know those of you on the advocacy committee see some of the documents that mm -hmm. I forward, a lot of the, our professional organizations do advocate for a lot of tweaks and changes around the tax cap because there are some very reasonable things that you could do to help mitigate some of these uncontrollable costs. Um, we have not selected to advocate for those, and a lot of districts haven't at the local level because they're not really politically popular, to be quite honest. So, it, so it's always kind of straddling the how do you continue to move the needle forward on making sure that you're doing, setting public education up to be sustainable, but also being respectful of those price controls and respectful of taxes and the burden that it does put on communities. So I think, you know, we can, I don't, we, we Jim does the five-year forecast every year, yes. but we all know the farther out you get, the less accurate it is because the variables of every given year are different and are somewhat, you're making your best crystal ball guess. So um, I don't have a perfect answer. I don't think any of us have the perfect answer for that, but I know that has always been our goal is to push that out, to be as strategic and wise about decisions in every given year so that we can continue to push that, that point out. And I, I don't feel that, just knowing Jim and his team, that you're going, that the community would ever get an, uh, blindsided by, hey folks, next year we've got to bust the tax cap. I don't, I, I feel that there would be a lot more indication than, you know, from one year to the next. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. I don't think it's going to be, if it ever happened, I don't think it would be an abrupt surprise. Tell me if I'm wrong, Jim, but I don't feel like <laughs> next year will <laughs> be. Uh, I don't, I wouldn't want to deliver that news in yeah, the exactly. first place, but I think, uh, yeah. Certainly, with, without, I would, I would expect, again, working with the board, the superintendent, finance committees, making sure that uh, everyone, we don't, we don't work uh, in a box. Yeah. We want to make sure everybody is aware of where we are. And uh, I think the benefit of working in the committee is also having the opportunity to share with the committee members, okay, what's, what am I thinking about? They can share what they're thinking about, uh, again, to, to move the district forward. Like, I guess going back to the strategic plan, because for me, and looking at other, some other district strategic plans, sometimes mm -hmm. the financial part is, you know, one of the pillars. Mm -hmm. yes. And I think it has to, you know, the, the programmatic part mm -hmm. and the financial, you know, it has to fit together. Yeah. So maybe this strategic plan, you know, the, mm -hmm. the financial part is, you know, just as important as the program mm -hmm. programmatic mm -hmm. part in yep. terms of sustainability. Mm -hmm. Yep. 
well, thank you to the board yep. and the community, right? Yep. This, is, uh, this is the end of the review process. We're gonna meet with, uh, again, finance committee, uh, thoughts, changes, and obviously, um, whether it's through the superintendent, the board members, to the, to yep. the committee members, uh, and we'll try to communicate very clearly uh, where the budget is uh, before the meeting on yep. the 17th. Have you set the finance committee date as yet? Uh, no, I was thinking probably a week from today. Uh, but it's kind of polling Depending the members to see where they are. So we've got a week in between. And maybe the state budget will settle. We can always hope. Yeah. It's possible, actually. That would, be, yeah. that would be very helpful. Maybe after the weekend. And, um, yeah. and just wanted to thank Jim and Jackie and Dr. Champ for coming in on the last day of spring break to, <laughs> to talk with us about this stuff. Um, we appreciate okay. it. I only came in virtually, but yeah, you're welcome. Still. <laughs> <laughs> Regular day for the business office. <laughs> we, we don't get the school breaks. Yeah, and I was going to okay. say, in the business office, that's what I've learned. The business office cycle, just the work flows at, on a different, a different timeline. Yeah. So I have always appreciated you, them, that they're just, they're always there. <laughs> the rest of, you know, the rest of the, the cycle, we all kind of have a little bit of an ebb and flow and are able to take some of those breaks along with the students and the, and the um, faculty. But uh, business thank office, you. always there group. cranking through. And Jackie, thank you, Jackie. Yeah, yeah. unbelievable work mm -hmm. from the business office, yeah. as always. So. Thank you. <laughs> All right. So if you do have any additional thoughts, adjustments you'd like to see, please let Jim and I know uh, before. We, we'd like to be able to go into the finance committee meeting with things, you know. Yeah. Uh, you know pretty solid so that we're, as he said, ready to get that to you prior to our next meeting. So you've got the level of comfort you need. As Jim says, that's the point at which it becomes, goes from being superintendent's budget yes. to being the board's budget. So we want you comfortable with that. Okay. And then the public's budget. And budget. then, yes, hopefully, yeah. becomes the board, public's budget. Okay. Would you like to give a um, super brief, brief. yeah, I, I know we want to really, again, be, as Michael said, be respectful, to try to keep the e evening as brief as possible. So only a couple comments for me tonight, um, and largely because um, we were able to provide the board with a quarterly report um, last week. Um, so thanks to the cabinet for the hard work on all the work that's happened in the last quarter and helping to put that report together. Um, so we just want to uh, help you know that we're on track for uh, achieving those SMART goals that were put out this year. So we're looking forward to wrapping up. A lot of the uh, remaining pieces are, not, are on target to happen in these last couple of months of the school year. Um, hope everyone enjoyed their spring break. Uh, the only other thing I was going to highlight tonight, we had originally scheduled to uh, recognize uh, Principal Fareed Johnson for being recognized by Saney's as uh, Principal of the Year. Given the weather, I didn't want him to come for uh, that short of a, a recognition right in the middle of the storm, so I sent him home. Um, so we'll be uh, moving that recognition to our next meeting. Okay. That's it for me tonight. And uh, the cabinet, we've already, I've already told them to uh, since, you know, we've had the spring break. School, school day wise, I think we met only like four days ago. So uh, we're giving them, they're off the hook on reports for tonight. Um, any Board of Education Committee reports? I guess we talked a lot about finance, finance committee. Yep. Anything else? Uh, no? Okay. Um, then I think we can move on to yep. financial reports and motions. Yep. And I would suggest that we have a motion to approve 6.1 through 6.6 6. as a consent agenda. So moved. Second. And just a couple really quick comments. Um, 6.1 is the adjustment on the Board of Education meeting dates. So we hadn't updated a couple of the calendars as of this morning because we were waiting for today to come so we could approve these new dates. But just a reminder that what this is doing is setting our board meeting dates back to what they originally were. Um, after the, our conversation last time, you recall, we adjusted how we're gonna approach strategic planning. So this sets the board meeting dates back to what they were prior, back to our normal 6.30 starts in most cases. Um, it did also add in the strategic planning dates uh, because that is a meeting of the full board, we wanted to represent those on that document as well. 
So that's that. Uh, the other item I wanted to highlight is 6.4. Um, it's a recommendation to award a contract to school leadership, uh, an executive search firm, to lead the search uh, to find our next assistant superintendent for teaching and learning. Um, the uh, uh, it's a different firm than we've used in the past, um, but the consultants actually have worked in the district before. Uh, the ones we'll be working with would be uh, Ken Mitchell and Susan Wolin, who did some board, uh, retreat, a board retreat for us a few years back. Uh, I think prior to any of the current board members being on, but they, so they, they're familiar with the district um, and they are very familiar with Westchester and with the, um, they work with Tri-States, they work with Manhattanville College. Um, they're really, um, I, I really felt it was important to have consultants that, um, that really know the players in the region to really get us top quality. And this also will expand our reach beyond the region as well, but they know the, um, the expectations of Westchester, they know the tri-states consortiums and high-performing districts like ours. So we wanna make sure that we get a, a really a great uh, person to come in Dr. Bowman's footsteps. So I think they'll be the right firm for us. Thank you. Okay, all in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, the motion carries unanimously. And that brings us to policy monitoring. And we have a second reading of policy 5720, transportation of students, um, which was discussed in policy committee. Yep. Um, this is a change to allow parents to take their yeah, in, in really extreme situations where, say, a bus doesn't arrive, the district was had planned to provide transportation and something happened and that did not, uh, the district's transportation is no longer available, it would give uh, me the authority to work with the athletic director to approve alternative uh, arrangements so that we wouldn't have uh, to, say, forfeit a meet or a game or things like that. If the the bus doesn't show up. Correct. Yep, mm -hmm. that's the exact example that we wanted to try to avoid in the future. Um, this is the second reading, but you had suggested we maybe waive the third reading yeah. so that this if could be no in place for spring, spring season because we have had bus incidents this, this year. year. Yeah. So yeah. yeah. So I would rec if there's no concerns with this policy, I would recommend that we waive the third reading and, and move to approval. Would anyone like to make a motion to waive the third reading? So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, Thank that you. carries unanimously. And then I would accept a motion to approve policy 5720. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, that motion carries unanimously. Thank you very much. Okay, then I would suggest a motion to approve 8.1 through 8.3 as a consent agenda. So moved. Second. Seconded. Okay. Any comments or questions? Uh, no, I, I know Jim has a comment. Uh, yeah, just uh, just a, a sad moment, uh, unfortunately. Um, a, a, a former employee of the district and uh, former, and I guess uh, now former district employee of Pella Manor passed away uh, this, this past week, uh, Billy May. Uh, Billy was a young man, died unexpectedly uh, this week, and certainly our health, heartfelt sympathies are extended to his family. Uh, Billy was a great kid. He worked for us about a year and a half. Uh, then he, uh, he moved over to Pella Manor in their DPW department. And uh, we were sad to see him go, but uh, it was always nice to see him. He always met us with a smile and a wave He'd come over and shake our hand, and uh, it was again. He was he was always a, just a really nice person and a really uh, optimistic and bright person to to, uh, to see every day. And he always felt good walking away after after speaking to him. So uh, certainly uh, we're very very sad. And uh, again, certainly our, uh, our our sympathies are extended to Billy's family at this time, and to the Pella Manor family at the time at this time as well. So I just want to take that moment. He's 26 years old. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah, thank you. All, all in favor of this consent agenda? Aye. 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 And that carries unanimously. And finally, um, I'll accept a motion to approve Schedule D. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, that carries unanimously. And any new business? 
Not tonight. Okay, then I would accept a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, we are adjourned. All right, thank you, thank you. all.